excited to be back at Sustainable Brands again. Can you put your hands together and let Coan and her team know? Really, let them know. That is, without a doubt, the happiest you're going to be during my presentation. That is it. It's all downhill from here. I am, I'm kind of like the morning after Annie's tequila. Because I want to talk about a topic that is arguably taboo, or at least something that we don't want to pay our attention to unless we have to, which is, what do we do when we're facing a shrinking economy, when the headwinds that we already face, bringing purpose to life inside our personal lives, inside our companies, inside the world at large, are compounded by all these economic drivers that are working against us? What do we do in those circumstances? And yet, as unpleasant as that is, now is the time to address this topic. Why? Because between now, the next four days here at Sustainable Brands, June 2016 and June 2017, a lot is going to change. We have a new political landscape. And I've been living in the States for 15 years, and I became a naturalized citizen just a few weeks ago because it's all hands on deck right now. <laughs> it, took, it took certain people to... But even above and beyond that, as a function of the political landscape, you know, as a part of the political process, there's a lot of propping up that goes on. What happens when that propping up falls away? What happens when, God forbid, the economy course corrects, the stock market course corrects? Who here has seen the proliferation of for sale signs in their neighborhood in the last few months? And everyone's like, let's, let's get out of here while we still can. This is the reality of the world we're now living in. And so while I'm not a I'm not an economist and I'm not an analyst. Like many of you in this room, I try and keep my aperture as open as possible to see what are the forces that are going to inform not only my company and, and its mission in the world, but really the realization of purpose at large so that sustainability, purpose becomes a way of being in the world rather than an add-on when times are good. And so let's look at three things. The market and uh, economic corrections, the consumer mindset, and what does that mean for brands? And this is where it, it just really starts to get quite depressing. It's kind of like the business case for self-medication. So if we look, you know, whether we take the, the view of Blackstone saying US recession coming in 2017, or whether we look at The Guardian talking about global recession coming being most likely principally because of a slowdown in China, whether you look at Bloomberg reporting a, you know, incremental decrease in retail sales and auto sales, when you look at the Wall Street Journal talking about the increased likelihood of a recession. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to put your hands together for the most depressing graphic you're going to see in the next four days at Sustainable Brands. This is JP Morgan's prediction as to whether we have a US recession coming or not. So that spirit, that joy, that elevation you felt at the beginning, I hope that it's slowly pouring out of your body. But this is the reality of the world that we face. And to ignore it is to court disaster on so many levels but perhaps most importantly, it's to let go of our mandate, which is to drive change. Because the people in this room, every single one of you, are nodes in a network of change. And we need you when things are good. But we need you even more when things are bad. And this is why. This is what's going to happen. The consumer mindset, there's going to be a decrease in disposable income, brand loyalty, an increase in brand scrutiny and reliance on word of mouth marketing and a rise in consumer activism, which is so palpable and visceral on a daily basis, whether you're on Facebook or Snapchat. And then in terms of brand vulnerabilities, the implications are huge. You've got a decrease in sales and profits. Your employees get depressed. They get fearful for their jobs. You've got to leverage your reputation more. You've got to make your marketing dollars go further. And you've got more and more pressure from competition and to really keep and even gain more mind share out there in the marketplace. Every single one of us knows this from 2007 and 2008, right? Do you kind of throw up a little bit in your mouth when you remember that time, a visceral physical response? You're like, oh my god, are we really going back there? We are overdue, historically, for some sort of course correction like that. So to ignore it is to court disaster, and we have a, a political environment which is really if we, if we don't pay attention to it, we can be distracted and, and not realize that it's coming. And all of this is in the context of, you know, um, Harvest Media's Meaningful Brands report when they said that most people around the world would not care if 74% of brands disappeared. There's no such thing as brand loyalty anymore. I have a 16 and a 13-year-old daughter. They didn't even know what a brand is. All they know is a piece of content in front of them, which 
just disappears ephemeral within the next 24 hours. There's no such thing as loyalty as we understood it when we were growing up. And so it's very easy to think that when times get tough, you've got to double down and lean into your product. You've got to take a transactional mentality. You've got to shore up the bottom line. But every single one of us in this room needs to be able to make the business case for doing something which might appear counterintuitive, which is to lean into purpose and to leverage it to shore up your company and its mission in times of challenges. And the, the opportunity today is just to share with you a few ideas, actionable ideas how to do that. And sustainable brands will be sharing this content and you'll be able to take it back with you. So it's not about capturing this, but rather transposing how it might apply to your business. And there's five areas, employees, customers, consumers, marketing, and culture. So let's look at employees in terms of you know, rationalizing it down to three key action steps that will make a difference within your organization and by extension, its impact in the world. You have to define your purpose in simple and emotional terms. We did a comprehensive, diligent, multi-week survey before we came here, and we came to astonishing results, which is 100% of you are qualified to be human. Every single one of you is still, we are still, our employees are still human beings sitting around a campfire telling stories, and they want to be related to from a heart level. Secondly, you have to share that purpose through your organization, through your all-staff meetings, your town halls, it might be on SharePoint, it might be your employee blog. Let your employees know what you stand for. And also, can we stop thinking about them as employees? They are human beings who show up every day and put sweat equity into building your vision. And I just think employees just doesn't really capture that sentiment. And then thirdly, we have to give them ways to participate. We have to be able to articulate to them here is a choice, a menu, a toolbox, so that they can show up, so that they can express themselves through the very way that they show up. If you look at all the studies, psychographics and otherwise, not everybody wants to do the same thing. And no one wants to be told what to do. So instead, you give people the opportunity to write a blog post, to volunteer, to donation match, whatever it might be. But even in that little act which recognizes that you see them as a human being, they're much more likely to show up and express themselves in ways that are unique to themselves, and therefore, they'll be much more engaged with your purpose. And you know, the great news is, is that we have data to back this up now. Imperative study from 2015 shows that purpose-oriented workers stay in organizations longer, and they're 50% more likely to take leadership positions. This is the business case you need to make with leadership when everything inside your company culture is working against you. In fact, those same purpose-driven employees, 47% high promoters of the brand, high levels of meaning, their experience of meaning through their work, high leadership potential, and high retention. These are all bottom line additions to your business. And if you, look, if you want a great example, look at Timberland's Path of Service initiative, which has been around since 1992. They get full-time 40 hours to contribute to causes. In 2014, 72,000 participants, 78% of the company had done it at some point. A palpable example of bringing your purpose to life through your employees and institutionalizing it, making it a tradition that your employees look forward to. And if they break down how they do it, they break it down into five steps. Create opportunities, leverage senior leaders, recognize and celebrate those who are participating, foster employee ownership of those initiatives, and then tell those stories. Too many brands forget to close the feedback loop. You get all your employees meaningfully and, and in a very human sense engaging with these initiatives, then, then you fail on a human level to capture that story and share it back with them so that they see that their sweat equity actually made a difference. Don't, don't forget to close the story loop. Secondly, customers, B2B world. B2B is now B2C, B2B2C, B2G is B2C. I'm not sure if those acronyms help anymore, do they? Anyway, the point is this. You have to tell your customers what you stand for because it gives you the opportunity to have a values alignment to mitigate risk. Every consumer has been raised on intuitive technology and watched their Facebook feed for the last 10 years and Occupy Wall Street and, and Arab Spring, and they have a they know nothing other than consumer activism, in which case they look behind the retailer to find out who made the product and how was it made, in which case retailers need to work with suppliers and vendors and, and, and to be customers that can stand up and say there's a values alignment, not just between in terms of our product, but who we work with. And then you need to give them a positive story to tell. It is so powerful to go into a retailer or potential customer and say to them, not only are we aligned in terms of what we care about, 
but we've articulated a human story that you can leverage to your benefit with consumers. And if we had to quantify that, again, through the lens of a business case, if you look at the UK 2016 Reputation Dividend Report, there's a very encouraging increase in the role that community and environment, environmental responsibility has in terms of degree of impact, in terms of business driver, between 2013 and 2016. In fact, when they had to quantify the impact of CSR work amongst S&P 500 companies, it actually came out to 10.7%. 10.7% of the aggregate value of those companies came from their CSR work. That gets the CEO's attention. That gets the CMO's attention. The business case is here. And if you want to look at a great example, you know, you've got the global wool supplier, Woolmark, headquarters in Australia, and there they are out in the world, not only making their, their, their product responsibly, but at the same time they're educating manufacturers, designers, how to actually take it to market in responsible ways. And it's so wonderful to see B2C companies, restaurants, going back up their supply chain and educating farmers and fishermen how to, how to harvest their product more responsibly. And it's equally exciting to see B2B companies or suppliers educating their customers. This is the dynamic through which we transform the entire supply chain. Third area, consumers, B2C. You need to leverage purpose through simple and emotional storytelling. Those <laughs> Those supercomputers in our pocket that are possibly irradiating the most important parts of our bodies even as we speak uh, are tools through which we can transform a customer into a marketer on behalf of your brand. The power of social technology is not one to one, it's one to one to many. That's the power of social technology. So distill your message down to a simple, consistent, and scalable message, and then you'll you'll transform your customer community to an, extension, to an extension of your marketing department. And then consistently communicate on the basis of shared values and a common goal. Every single one of us has hundreds of different things we could be doing with our attention right now. Probably looking at the same Facebook page over and over again, just in case anything has changed in the last 45 seconds. But if you're going to command their attention, the conversation you lead, the story you are telling has to be meaningful and relevant to their lives. And so you have to consistently lean back into those shared values. And then when they do participate, when they have chosen to give you their greatest gift these days, which is their attention, I, in fact, I think I've almost forgotten the color of my daughter's eyes. They're like this. Hey, Dad, I love you. Yeah, good night. Right, right. I have yet to see them like this. It's been like almost two years. The point is, when somebody actually participates in your brand storytelling, actively amplifies your story in service of your mission because it's meaningful to them, Again, just like dropping the feedback loop with employees, recognize them, celebrate them. Don't just move on to the next outbound engagement opportunity because you have robbed them of their humanity. You have, by your absence or your, your, your ignorance of their effort, you have told them that it didn't really mean anything to you. And you know what? This is not a nice to have anymore. It's a must have. If you look at Edelman's Trust Barometer report, 80% of global consumers now believe it's possible for an organization to serve their bottom line and build their business and have a positive social and environmental impact. They expect you to do that. This is not, we're not, we're way beyond 50%. This is what your audience wants. And another great example is Whole Foods, that whether it's their signage in their employees HQ or in their stores, their marketing, their employee videos, the, the digital dashboards inside their restaurants that allow you to drill down on their supply chain. Those organizations are manifesting their mission at every touch point of the brand so consumers are educated about the brand and can speak on your behalf. The fourth area, marketing. Not only is it a great idea to co-create, to co-own, to, to co-author your brand with your consumers because it offloads the content burden on you which is tiring and, it, and it's seemingly endless with all these channels out there, but it, it allows them to feel like they're part of that shared mission. And so the first thing you need to do is surrender control. You need to recognize that what you care about is what your employees care about, it's what your customers care about, it's what all stakeholders within your brand community care about, and to surrender control and say, we are in this together. That may sound like a subtle shift, but it's like any relationship. When your come from shifts, everything is transformed. And then once you do that, once you have that requisite mindset where you allow your customers to co-create their content, you can double down by reaching out to influencers and ambassadors to speak on your behalf 
because that will scale your reach and earn media. And then finally, instead of looking at each tactic in your outreach as some isolated incidents and we're breathlessly trying to keep up with everything as we all necessarily do, back out of the future you want to create. Look at where you want to be in 12 months, articulate, distill that down, and then look at all the tentpole events, the trade shows, the product launches that are coming, and then frame each of the engagement tactics in service of that. And most importantly, when you engage someone and you have their attention, don't then at the end of a, an ad buy or whatever just walk away and go, oh my god, I'm so happy I can finally have date night. You have to actually look at it and go, how do I keep that engagement? How do I upgrade it to the next level so you build a self-sustaining customer community over time? And how do they want to participate? What do consumers want to do? You know, Cone's 2015 Global CSR study tells you that 90% will stop buying your products if you're deceptive, 89% will buy your products if you're having a social and environmental impact, others will promote your CSR efforts, they'll, su they'll support a charity that you support. These are the different ways that our customers are saying, can we please pay a, play a part in realizing your purpose? And Patagonia does a wonderful job of this, whether it's through storytelling around stories we wear, or whether it's around concrete impact initiatives like Damnation. And let's look at the fifth and probably the most overlooked area through which you can realize your purpose in a way that will build your bottom line, and that is culture. Who wants more advertising in their life? I was an ad guy for 20 years in Australia, London, and all over the US. More advertising, more ads in Facebook, more ads in Snapchat, pop-ups, geo-targeting. No one, right? The reality is this. Your customer base does not want any more ads. They want to play, they want to participate in a conversation that is meaningful and relevant to their lives. And with that in mind, your higher order opportunity is to transcend your products, services, or category to shape culture. Look at Starbucks. Over the most recent three or four years, they've talked about gridlocking Congress, same-sex marriage, post-traumatic stress disorder, online in education for employees, racism, that has kept them top of mind and has generated so much earned media because it all falls under the auspices of shared planet, their overarching singular message which speaks to what is our experience of a shared planet? How does that show up in the world? So much so that Howard Schultz is on the cover of Time magazine last year with the headline, What Starbucks Knows About America. So you need to define, frame, and lead a cultural conversation. For Patagonia, it's what is responsible growth? What is yours? Ask yourself that question. And let that inform every piece of content you create. Tesla. When Elon Musk launched Tesla, he wrote a blog post that said, we want to enable sustainable mass transportation. That's why he opened up the IP of his battery technology. That's why he did a partnership with BMW and Nissan. That's why he launched an infinity mile warranty, because he was in service of his mission. And in similar terms, you need to be a mission with a company rather than a company with a mission. That's why REI resonated with Opt Outside and Patagonia resigna resonated with, um, don't buy this jacket. It wasn't a clever marketing idea. It was leaning into their purpose and mission in such a way that however it manifested itself was counterintuitive from a marketing point of view, and it cut through the Me Too marketing in their category. Meanwhile, all the competitors are standing there going, oh my god, how did they think of that clever tactic? They're not thinking of that clever tactic. They're thinking about how they can lean into their purpose, which is exactly what we all need to do, even more so in the next 12 months. And this is now becoming a competitive landscape. When you look at Fortune Magazine's Change the World list, here you've got a new index, Fit for Purpose, which actually talks about how well different brands deliver on their stated purpose. This is becoming a competitive landscape. This is a manifestation of how real and tangible and critical purpose is within the marketplace. And it's manifesting itself in so many interesting ways. I mean, just an example with Adidas, or Adidas, when they came out with their sustainability report a few days ago, or a few weeks ago, they said, we need places to play. Our relevance in the world, the reason Adidas needs to be a sustainability leader is we want to protect places to play. That's the higher order conversation they're leading. And that drills all the way down to the products that are manifestations of that same mission or intent, 
where they're now making shoes completely from recycled ocean waste. So this is the compressed complexity that you can leverage where you can speak to all your different stakeholders in very specific ways and talk to your product and its benefits directly and still ladder up to a larger cultural conversation around protecting, enabling, enhancing, renewing places to play. And what's the result? You know, bottom line perspective. If you look at the driving revenue growth for sustainable products report from 20, uh, 2015, between 2010 and 2013, revenue from company-defined portfolios of sustainable products grew by 91%. And you can see with those companies listed there, the percentage of sustainable products growing from 18% to 26% between 2010 and 2014. This is a growth category. It's not a well-intended, nice-to-have category. Or if you look at HBR's the, the Business Case for Purpose last year, they interviewed 485 companies, and they found that 58 of them, 58% of them, enjoyed 10% growth or more when they prioritized purpose. This is a business driver. This is not something to walk away when everything is working against you, when the reptilian brain and some of the people around you gets fearful and says, we need to retreat to what we know, which is a transactional relationship with our, our customers, and all we talk about is price point and the product benefits. You still need to engage the, the human being. And when you do that, you get this result. And I want you to think of this not just in terms of the individual spokes of the wheel, but the integrity of the whole. When you leverage purpose with your employees, you get productivity. With customers, you get that alignment. With consumers, you get loyalty. With marketing, you get that earned media, that amplification. And with culture, you get to transcend your category to really be perceived as a cultural leader, which is an incredibly aspirational place for any brand to be. And so if I could ask you to take away one thing in the context of what's going to unfold between Sustainable Brands 2016 and Sustainable Brands 2017, when you're going to have to be more resilient and steal yourself more than ever in terms of purpose, it's that strategic purpose drives sustainable profit. And your contribution is needed now more than ever. Thanks so much.